morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of 2016. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide papers in an electronic format. Uh, apologies have been received today from Cara Hilton. Um, our first item on the agenda today is to decide whether to consider item four in private at this and future, future meetings. Item four is in relation to considering a draft for our legacy report. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, our first substantive item, item two, is evidence on the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. Uh, and I welcome Bill Thompson, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, and Brenda McKinney, Investigations Manager, Office of the Commissioner for Public Life in Scotland. Uh, Mr Thompson, would you like to make any opening statement? Thank you, Convener. Um, I submitted a letter, I think it's dated the 11th of February, which I presume members have access to. Um, and for the moment, I have nothing to add to that. I'm just happy to move to questions. And okay, do my best that's to answer fine. Them. Um, first of all, uh, we can see uh, from the report uh, that uh, the amount of uh, complaints has dropped. Um, do you think that um, that's because uh, there are less problems out there? Or is that because uh, the public, uh, many who, uh, who have complained previously, feel that their complaints have not been acted upon? I have no information to suggest that there are people who feel their complaints have not been acted upon, um, although you may be about to provide me with some. Um, nor do I have any way of gauging whether the range and number of problems is more or less than it has been in the past. Um, although the number of complaints has dropped, uh, you'll be aware that uh, in the year covered by the annual report, the figure for the number of complaints was, I would suggest, distorted by a very substantial number uh, relating to one particular issue which were dealt with as a single case. Um, I projected the number of cases which we have to investigate this year um, on the basis of the figures that you have up to the end of December, and that suggested that the total for the year would be 121. This is in relation to councillors and members of public bodies. In fact, um, as of the end of February, which of course we've just passed, we already have 121 cases. Um, so the volume of business with which we're dealing with, with which we're dealing, doesn't seem to me to be reducing significantly. How would you respond to uh, a member of the public who may say um, that reporting anything to yourself is a waste of time? It's a scenario that I've come across on a number of occasions of late. I'm not sure how I would respond to that. Um, I think I'd like to know why the member of public thought it was a waste of time. I don't see how I can answer it unless I have some indication of why that person thought it was a waste of time. In terms of um, your responses to members of the public um, after uh, an investigation and after you've come to a decision, um, do you think you explain um, the situation well enough in the communication uh, to the complainant about why it is you've reached the decision that you have? I always do my best to do so. Uh, I accept that um, improvement is always possible. I also would draw the committee's attention to the fact that approximately a fifth of the complaints which I receive um, are based on allegations of failure to comply with the key principles which are set out in the code but are, are not part of it in terms of being rules which can be breached. Um, and in those circumstances, although I always write and ask people if they have anything else they wish to suggest by way of a breach of the specific rules of the code, uh, there are many circumstances where people don't have anything else to put forward. 
So the chances are that around a fifth of the people who submit complaints are dissatisfied. And that is not because of failure on my part to explain things. That is simply because they think they have a valid complaint. But the way the code is drafted, um, it's not. So do you think that there needs to be changes to the drafting of, of the code, which should maybe satisfy members of the public um, in that regard? There are different views on this. For what it's worth, I would prefer that the key principles were not included in the code. It's not that I'm suggesting for a moment that they're unimportant, but it misleads a lot of people. Uh, so far this year, at least 48, uh, into thinking that somebody has breached the code. And it's not at all clear, other than to those who read carefully paragraph 2.1 of the code, it's not at all clear uh, that failure to observe the key principles is something other than a breach of the code. And I think that is confusing for a lot of people. I also think it takes up a lot of time and energy uh, and produces nothing at the end of the day. So I can appreciate people in those circumstances feel frustrated and dissatisfied. So uh, the key principles that are written into the code um, where folk think there have been a breach because they are key principles, paragraph 2.1 blows all of the, uh, that out of the water. Is that what you're saying? It does. So um, what attempts have you made to get the code changed so that people are not being led up the garden path and thinking um, that they have been ignored, uh, that the breach that they have reported has been ignored, um, and uh, which leads them to uh, what I've already said, thinking that uh, actually complaining in the first place was a waste of time? I'm not sure why you're putting the question in that form. Uh, convener. Um. That for Mr. Thompson, because basically where you have led to me in terms of your answers um, actually uh, leads to some of the things that have been said to me by members of the public in recent times. Okay. My statutory role is to investigate. It's a narrowly defined role. Um, I have a view which I have just expressed to this committee that the inclusion of the key principles leads to confusion and dissatisfaction. Um, I'm not convinced that it is necessarily part of my role to seek amendment to the code, but if anyone were to ask me in what way I think it could be amended, that would certainly be one suggestion I would put forward. Okay, so you don't think that you should be uh, making suggestions about changes to the code? That's not what I said, Convener. I said if anyone were to ask me, that is something I would suggest. Um, I think you said that it wasn't up to you uh, to ask for changes to the code just prior to that, though, Mr Thompson. I said it's not part of my statutory remit. Uh, it may not be part of your statutory remit, but there are often things which are not parts of statutory remit, but that doesn't stop folk from suggesting various things at various points. No, indeed, and I've done it to the committee this morning. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Good morning, Ms. McKinney. Uh, just to follow on from the Convener's uh, comments, uh, doing some calculations from the 1st of April last year to the 31st of December, uh, the number of uh, breaches and the number of uh, complaints made. If you start taking these figures, then you find that less than 4% of the complaints made actually led to a breach, was identified as a breach. And then when you start going into the other uh, figures, you then find it's roughly 9% of the total number of cases that were taken forward uh, are then identified as breaches. Now, I think, we, and I, I, I never want to speak to the, for the convener, but I think in terms of my understanding of where the convener was trying to come from is when members of the public or others make a complaint and what you've told us today is that because the key principles people misinterpret the key principles in terms of the code that they make a complaint based on what they think is there and yet what they find out once they've made the complaint and the response they get is well that's not part of the code therefore doesn't form part of a breach would it not be easier 
to make it more understandable for the public and others to understand exactly the areas where the, there is a, could report what they perceive to be a breach, rather than a large number of complaints being made in this, in this situation uh, in the nine months that I've cited, you find that only 10% uh, are taken forward and basically the, you end up with very low figures in relation to identified breaches and the rest of them you know, uh, not pursued further. Uh, then you get out with jurisdiction and then withdrawn. Would it not be easier? Because I, I note in your, further on in your report, you talk about the pressures that are on the delivery of the service because of the financial constraints there may be in coming years. But would it not be easier to actually try and adapt uh, the guidance that's issued to the public or made aware to the public in relation to what they can actually report as a breach? Mr Thompson. I agree entirely. So, and would you, in your position, want to make that recommendation? Uh, yes. If, so if, if code could be simplified and made clearer, uh, that would make everybody's life better. I think it would be better for councillors um, who have to observe it, uh, and some of it is quite difficult, frankly. Um, I have no role, and in this, the convener may come back to me, but I have no role in terms of issuing guidance, um, as you'll be aware, under some of the statutes under which I operate. I'm actually specifically disbarred from giving advice, and that is because I'm the person who would have to investigate a complaint. However, the Standards Commission, to whom I report uh, on these matters, do issue guidance, uh, and I'm aware that they are in the process of revising it. Um, however, Although that may improve the guidance, uh, the issue, and I think this comes back to where the convener started, the issue is the code itself. Um, and if the code itself is complicated or not clear, then that cannot be remedied by guidance. Well, if you're saying the code's not fit for purpose, then how do we make it fit for purpose? I didn't say it wasn't fit no, I'm, for I'm purpose. Saying that, that, well, I'm, I'm taking from what you're saying at the present moment is that, and it's my term that I'm using is the it's not fit for purpose so how do we get the and how do you as a commissioner the, the person responsible for enforcing the code make sure that we actually have something that is workable and doesn't take up a lot of time effort and energy on behalf of you and your staff to deal with cases that are not competent to be dealt with I'm sorry to be hesitant because I don't think the answer is simple. Um, as you're well aware, um, the code is promulgated by ministers. Um, so ministers would have to agree that there was uh, a reason to review the code. Um, and as it happens, I suspect that will be done at least for the narrow um, purpose of making sure that it is sufficient in relation to integration joint boards um, which are active now. Um, I think it would be important, I'm sorry, you're asked, you've asked me quite a wide question and I apologise for taking a little bit of time to answer it. Um, obviously councillors or representatives of councillors would have to have a say in any adjustment to the code since it um, affects their behaviour uh, and their conduct and how that might be complained about. Um, so I would have thought the major players in this uh, would be yourselves uh, as representatives of the people who might complain um, and with an interest specifically in local government, uh, local government bodies, perhaps individual councils uh, and the appropriate minister. I'm certainly happy to contribute. Um, and so, if you're asking me, I think there are other areas which do require attention. Would that not be more appropriate for the Standards Commission to actually bring forward recommendations to the Scottish Government? Uh, for the Scottish Government, as you said, it's up to the Scottish Government uh, to either uh, reject or accept 
the recommendations from the Standards Commission because while I mentioned earlier it's about the time and effort that's spent by you and your staff, I know that when there's a complaint made against a councillor, there is a lot of council officer time that's taken up with dealing with a complaint as well. And that's why I'm making the comment about if we were to simplify the code or make the code more understandable, then that would save a lot of uh, unnecessary effort and time. And, I, and, and that's why I agree with you entirely. And, and the other factor in this, of course, is the, um, the private energy, if I can put it that way, which goes into this. There's public resources in dealing with it in my office, uh, in councils, um, and for that matter, the Standards Commission, if I report to them that there's been a breach. But there's the private energy uh, and time of individuals, and I appreciate that people do not complain lightly. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, and if that could be channeled better, that would be a good thing in itself. You said um, during that last exchange that there are other issues um, that, um, that could be uh, dealt with. Could you tell us now what issues you think uh, need to be dealt with? What needs to be changed to make all of this more effective? I think in fairness, Convener, um, I cannot give you a comprehensive answer right now. But the thing which is top of my list um, is the way in which the code applies to statements made in social media where some folk will make um, a, a, an opinion known or maybe throw an insult at somebody and then claim that that account is a personal account and they can do what they like. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Um, that's a slightly extreme version of it, but yes, precisely that. Um, the code only applies, as you're well aware, to uh, the actions of councillors um, where they are acting as councillors. Um, it doesn't apply, nor should it apply, uh, to their private conduct. Um, and the most problematic grey area is in relation to what is said uh, on social media. OK. You say that you cannot give us um, a, a full list today. Um, what I think we require, then, is a comprehensive list of the areas where you think that there are difficulties um, so that uh, uh, our successor committee um, can look at all of that uh, and bring uh, that to the attention uh, of others if we deem that to be, if they deem that to be necessary. I think we're never going to resolve some of these difficulties unless we know exactly what they all are, uh, get them all on the table um, and then look at it from that point. So if we could have a comprehensive list from you, I think, uh, well, uh, maybe our successor committee won't be grateful for it, but at least it gives them a starting point. Uh, sorry, John, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to, to follow up on that, Convener, uh, just to ask Mr Thompson of his view, when is an elected member not an elected member? Um. There's no simple answer to that. Um, I'm tempted to respond humorously, but that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, it's actually quite a difficult issue. Um, if an elected member gives a quotation to a newspaper, which is then published, um, certainly if it relates to council business, and I'm talking here about members elected to councils, um, my position has been um, that that is covered by the code. Um, it has actually featured in one or two uh, hearings, and that certainly has been the position that the Standards Commission have adopted or agreed with so far. Um, if they make the same comments in, um, on Facebook or uh, on their Twitter account, it is much less clear whether they're acting as a councillor and covered by the code. I'm quite surprised at that because in terms of the, and I'll give you a case reference, uh, LA forward slash NL forward slash 1862, uh, an issue was raised at a full council meeting, uh, and you'll know the local authority by the, the coding, 
Uh, and I won't name the individuals and I won't name the local authority for uh, save their embarrassment in terms of how they deal with the issues. But in real, relation to that, uh, a le legal letter was submitted to a full council meeting which then stopped the, the discussion of a motion. Uh, now, the, the understanding of the proposers of the motion was that that issue could not be discussed at full council. But two weeks later, uh, a councillor took the opportunity to comment in the press. Now, that was reported to your office and dealt with in your office. And you indicated at that time uh, that it was, it was a commentary on the motion and an expression of opinion as to the underlying motivation of the proposer and seconder. So when does something like that, in terms of the public domain, when the, a full council agrees not to discuss something to seek further legal clarification, and then you get elected members commenting in the local media. So and based on your issue, if the person had have commented in social media, then there wouldn't have been potentially a breach. But the person commented in the local press. So and what you said earlier was if it was a press comment, that it may be subject to investigation, but if it's social media, then that would be out with the scope at the present time. Uh, for in, in further investigation uh, in relation to that complaint. Convener, um, there's some difficulties here. Um, I have to make it clear, I didn't say that comments made on social media could not be covered. Um, what I said was that it is not clear that they are necessarily covered by the code. Um, the specific case uh, which Mr. Wilson raises, um, which I have some reservations about discussing. Um, obviously, my judgment is open to question by anybody. Um, the circumstances there were that the complaint was made that a ruling of the convener in a committee meeting or a council meeting had been ignored. Now, what I would ask Mr. Wilson is, if the convener in this meeting were to make a ruling, would that necessarily apply to those members of this committee who then go out and speak to other people about it? Unless it was a ruling, I would suggest to you that some business which you're dealing with is confidential and therefore must not be discussed. Um, I think there's at least a question as to whether the ruling would have any effect outside this committee meeting. And that was the problem in the North Lanarkshire case, which you were mentioning. As I said, I didn't want to name the local authority, but uh, Mr. Thompson has. Uh, in terms of the ruling, the ruling was that the council were seeking further legal advice on the, the issue at hand. Uh, and that is one of those areas where, yes, you're right, in terms of the if a convener, and I would expect uh, the convener and others uh, to, if they made a ruling such as that, the, the members would at least respect uh, that ruling until further advice, legal advice, had been given. Uh, so it's, it's really just trying to, uh, and you, you quite rightly said that your interpretation may be open to question, but at the, at the present moment there is no, as I understand it, no right of appeal in terms of your decision. Uh, but can I move on, convener, in relation... Can we let Mr Thompson talk about right of appeal first before we do move on? Can I just come back to that? Um, obviously, there are political issues at play here, um, not necessarily in this room, but there are in many of the complaints I handle. Um, rulings by the chair or convener uh, about the application of standing orders uh, apply to council business. They don't necessarily apply in a wider sense. Um, there is no right of appeal against uh, a decision on my part that there is no breach. I'm sorry, I'm trying to put that in positive uh, terms uh, and avoid double negatives. If I decide on the basis of a complaint that there is no evidence of a breach, um, I make a decision and that is that unless somebody is minded, as they can do, to apply for judicial review, which of course would be a, a resource-intensive process, um, 
it hasn't happened yet. It's not to say it won't happen. Um, but that is the only way, other than people writing to me, as they frequently do, and saying, well, you haven't properly given attention to this or that issue. Um, We're now collecting statistics uh, about the volume of what you might call post-decision correspondence, uh, and it is reasonably significant. Um, many people um, do question decisions, uh, and I try and deal with the points that they make. If I decide that there's been a breach, I report to the Standards Commission, and this is something maybe to come back to in terms of some of the earlier questions. Um, they then decide whether or not to hold a public hearing. Uh, they do so in 90-odd percent of cases. Uh, and at that point, effectively, the matter is considered anew, uh, and they make a decision on the basis of the evidence which comes to the public hearing. So the percentage which actually become a breach at the end of the day uh, maybe even less than the figures uh, quoted by Mr. Wilson. But there is a right of appeal uh, against a decision of the Standards Commission at a public hearing. Just to, for clarification, you said that if someone wasn't happy with the outcome of the deci your decision, they could go for judicial review, and that judicial review process would be via the Court of Session? I think it's the Court of Session, yes. It hasn't happened yet. Um, the other thing that some people do is complain to the uh, public sector, Scottish public sector ombudsman that my office has failed to administer their complaint correctly. And how many reports have been made to SPSO? Uh, last year there has been one so far. Um, Okay, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Just referring to Mr. Wilson's point, I just wanted to ask you about this social media. Are you monitoring social media? And your other point was, when, when I wasn't quite clear of the definition as to when an elected official is no longer elected official, particularly when he was reporting privately on social media, like Twitter or whatever it is. Does that mean exactly it's very difficult to judge that category, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, and is it it matter of judgment, is it? Um, until it's clarified... Um, if it can be clarified, yes, it is a matter of judgment. Um, and that is why I mentioned it is the issue which I think is most in need of attention. Um, I don't monitor, my office does not monitor social media as such, but we receive uh, a, a number of complaints which specify alleged breaches in the course of some sort of social media uh, correspondence. Sorry, and uh, are any of these sort of these complaints from social media post um, uh, you know, post complaint after you've made your decision, you know, coming back post correspondence as you called it? I'm sorry, I, I was talking about different things. Um, right. Post decision correspondence is where I've said, for example, there is no breach, um, and the person who complained then comes back. I, we call that uh, post decision. But, but does that come through? Social, is a lot of it concerned with social media or not? Um, no. It doesn't, I'm sorry, I may be not be understanding correctly. It doesn't generally come to me through social media, right. um, but it may, but the issue this. may be about social media. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Thompson uh, will correct me if I'm wrong here, but Mr. Thompson will only deal with any social media thing if a complaint comes right. in from someone about a post that an elected member has put on that media. Yeah. Correct. So there's no monitoring or censoring yeah. or anything like that. Mr. Thompson has to sit back and wait uh, and see if any complaints come in. Indeed. Probably crossing his fingers and hoping that there aren't any complaints. Uh, thank you. Okay. Anything else, Cameron? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, George Adam, please. Uh, yes, just, uh, on that same point, you know, I, I could probably give you a, a number of examples of councillors who probably from own neck of the woods and not necessarily my party who have rather poisonous uh, blogs and uh, are rather aggressive and robust on social media but nothing ever seems to be done about it you know how do we get to our position where because it's back to uh, the question that uh, john wilson asked when is an elected member not an elected member and it is a serious point it could almost be a punchline when you say it's that way but you know, it is a very serious point because we are 24-7 effectively elected members and people will read your blog and will actually interact with your social media because you are an elected member. So should there not be some form of responsibility that the councillors actually take on board? Um, first of all, 
I accept that elected members probably are always elected members in the sense that um, you are available as our councillors all the time. Um, the code does not, and for that matter, the MSP code should not apply to everything that uh, you do as elected members. Uh, but I entirely agree that there is a problem um, with social media. Um, it's not straightforward um, for a number of reasons. One that I haven't yet mentioned this morning uh, is Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which, as I understand it, as interpreted by uh, courts, uh, allows, if you like, additional leeway to those who are engaged in political dialogue uh, in the things that they might say by way of freedom of expression. Um, that is something that is a difficult thing to take into account when you're making a judgment, um, not so much about whether the comments in social media are covered, but whether they're then uh, a breach of the code. So there are two steps. Talk about language that is just unacceptable in the modern political landscape that's getting used, you know, the terms and uh, people that don't agree with them getting called various uh, kind of unacceptable uh, names. But every time there has been a complaint, it's not found uh, in favour of this individual in particular, mainly, and they just carry on. It's got to the stage now where no one actually complains anymore because it just the behaviour just seems to be the same. And that goes across the country, because let's be honest with you, um, I could probably tell you some of the cases that you've dealt with without reading uh, in depth, um, where it seems that um, certain folk think that they've got the right to insult the people who elected them uh, using blogs and Twitter and Facebook and uh, all of the rest of it, which in my mind is unacceptable. Um, and I'm sure in the mind of most others, it's unacceptable. And yet in terms of the code as it stands, it seems nothing could be done to deal with that. Well, yes. the language used as well, which is unacceptable. I have no disagreement with the points uh, which you're both making, but I not convinced, and the reason I mentioned it, I'm not convinced that the code deals clearly um, with that situation at the moment. Okay, again, if that can be highlighted in the correspondence that you will have, we will pass that on to the successor committee, um, because like Mr. Adam and probably many others around the table at this moment in time, that's certainly something that's been brought to my attention on a number of occasions. Um, George, you want to come back? Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Uh, <coughs> thanks very much, Convener. Hi, good morning, Bill. Um, I wonder if I could turn again to page four of your, your report. It's uh, the, on the table of outcomes and of complaints received. Uh, John Wilson led us in a discussion about that. But what I can see in the table, Bill, is that something like 75% of all the complaints raised are either not pursued any further, they're out with your jurisdiction, or they've been withdrawn. Three quarters of them in those categories. Does that mean it's given you a, an incredible amount of work in dealing with quite a, a large volume and percentage of complaints that really go no further? Is that an issue for you, for your office, or do you dismiss them at a fairly early stage in your your assessment of them? Some are dismissed at a fairly early stage. Um, I endeavour, um, despite the implication behind some of the questions, I endeavour. Um, to give as much support as possible to people who wish to complain and to make the position as plain as possible to people who wish to complain. Um, so there are... Uh, I quite often issue a letter which uh, indicates to the person who's complained that I'm not minded to pursue it because, and it may be that it's back to one of the other issues, simply about the key principles or because it appears to be entirely outside my jurisdiction. Uh, that letter invites people, if they wish, to come back uh, and give me further information or, or explain why I should take it further. Um, and I don't have the percentage here. Um, some of these we do take further, and then, even though we've looked into it, we discover that there is still um, nothing that could amount to a breach. Um, Obviously, it's important to be fair not only to the person who's complaining, but also to the person about whom the complaint is being made. Um, so uh, there's a balancing 
exercise there. Um, but it, yeah, of course it takes up quite a lot of time and effort. I mean, half of them are, according to the table bill, half of them are not pursued further. Yes. Is that effectively the same as no breach, in a sense? Yes. You know what I mean? You know? It is. So, I mean, it, it, <coughs> when you're looking at the data there, there's, there's only about 30, there's about a quarter of them result in a no breach determination. But the, half of them are just not pursued any further. It's, the, it's just to tease out with you what not pursued any further. I'm <laughs> sorry, I mean. I'm sorry, but that's not uh, helpfully clear. Um, they're described as no breach when they have actually been investigated. Um, those which are in the other category, um, yes, there is no breach. Uh, no, there is no breach. I don't know whatever the language is. There is no breach. Uh, but it's, that's been resolved because in many cases there could not be a breach. The circumstances at an extreme don't involve a councillor. I mean, sometimes we get them about officials who are not covered by the code, either in local authorities or in, in public bodies. Um, sometimes we get them about things which are simply not covered by the code at all, and sometimes it's key principles. Um, I, I, I should probably say, I will say this in, a, in the letter that conveners uh, required of me. Um, I don't think it would be good for anybody in my role, either me or any successor, to have to make judgments on whether or not people have complied with the key principles, um, because principles are so wide that I think that puts you into an invidious position. Um, I think they would have to be determined, if they became part of the code and could be breached, would have to be determined by a broader uh, tribunal of some sort, standards commissioner, whatever. But if the possible breaches are extended to include the key principles, then the whole system will balloon, frankly. Okay. Uh, but in, in, in all cases, or most if not all cases, you, you do respond, like, when, when you're saying not pursued further, that's half the cases, half the cases, right? Yep. You'll, there'll be an explanatory letter going back to the company. Well, absolutely, yes. What the circumstances were. And, uh, and do those sometimes involve quite a rigorous, uh, thorough assessment that takes quite a bit of time as well? Because that's half the cases you're dealing with. Um, or are they done fairly early on in your examination as well? It's a mixture, and I'm sorry, I don't have to hand... Um, or somewhere in my head, uh, the percentage which we go into in more detail. I'm very reluctant to dismiss things out of hand, as it were, because that's not fair to the person who's complained. Um, what if it's a vexatious complainer? I've suggested in my letter that that might be a category which we would not pursue, but it's difficult to determine at a very early stage whether the complaint is vexatious. But if somebody is complaining about the same thing again and again and again and again, um, surely that would be deemed to be vexatious and that you wouldn't spend too much time on that. I would endeavour not to, convener. Will I? Hey, uh, I was just going to ask, uh, I noticed in the other page, in page five there, Bill, where, are, where there are some cases where suspension has been the result, that's the sanction that was imposed, for example, a councillor suspended from planning meetings or council committee meetings. Is there pay suspended as well for that period or is it not? I don't understand that pay is suspended. Um, I don't think the Standards Commission has the powers which the uh, Parliament has to right. suspend uh, payment. Right. Okay. So it's suspension from meetings. But um, not, but not th there is an option to disqualify. Uh, the Commission right. Right. do have that option um, and obviously in those circumstances um, Pay does stop. Okay. Thanks. We've concentrated uh, a lot on yourself as the Commissioner today. Do you think the Standards Commission itself is fit for purpose? I don't think that's a fair question, Convener. Um, Why is that not a fair question, Mr. Thompson? Because they are an independent part of the process. I report to them, they, they then make a decision. It's not for me to determine whether they're doing it appropriately or not. Uh, the fact that uh, you won't deem whether they're doing something appropriately or not uh, would lead me to think that maybe there are certain things that they're not doing appropriately. That, I think, is drawing an inference, which uh, you're not in a position to do, I would suggest, convener. Okay. Um, in terms of the hearings that the Standards uh, Commission 
uh, have carried out in the number in the last number of years. You say that there uh, there's been a gradual but steady rise in the percentage of complaints um, that uh, uh, lead to a report and then a hearing. Um, how often, um, in terms of where there has been a hearing situation, has the Standards Commission uh, gone against the findings in your report? Um, in my period of office, which is now almost two years, only once. Okay, only once. And how many hearings has there been in that time, Mr. Thompson? Um, Thirteen concluded, one underway at the moment. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the Standards Commission, I realise that you're not going to tell me whether you think it's fit for purpose or not today. Um, in terms of your letter to the committee, uh, about uh, uh, improvement to the Code of Conduct, would, be, would you be willing um, in that letter to also uh, state what uh, could be done in terms of uh, helping uh, uh, to improve uh, your own office uh, and that of the Standards Commission? I'm happy to comment on my own office, convener. I, I really don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on the Standards Commission. In that case, do you think it would be wise for us uh, as well as to question you on an annual basis uh, to question members of the Standards Commission? I suspect that is open to you. Um... I think it's something that's never been done before by the Parliament, but from, uh, from what you're saying today, that might actually be something that our successor committee uh, may uh, actually uh, wish to consider. Uh, can you maybe give us some comment uh, about your strategic plan and your uh, prioritisation of investigating um, uh, particular things uh, and how you propose to use your discretion in that regard? Yes. I'm, as you will have appreciated from the letter which I have sent to you, um, I'm conscious that I need to find some way um, of preventing there being a continual expansion of the workload um, because the resources available to cope with it will not simply expand uh, in parallel. I'm doing several things. One is attempting to improve the efficiency of our operation which I would hope all public bodies seek to do. Um, that has to be done within the context of thoroughness uh, and fairness and, as you were inviting me to indicate, convener, uh, trying to improve on the clarity uh, with which things are explained to those who complain, or for that matter, those against whom complaints are made. Um, I'm also wondering, uh, and I'm proposing to set out my stall as to circumstances in which complaints may not uh, be investigated as thoroughly as people might like me to do. Um, and that is why I have set out in the letter a list of bullet points of possible circumstances in which I might decline to pursue an investigation uh, as far as I might be invited to do. Um, this is quite difficult, frankly. Um, not only would I then be exercising judgment on whether or not there's been a breach, um, but I'm then exercising judgment as to whether it is worth investigating or not. Um, and that is something which is patently quite controversial, uh, given that the person who has complained thinks it's worth investigating. Um, it's very easy at the top of the list, if it's outside my jurisdiction, if it simply relates to key principles and therefore cannot be a breach of the code, uh, it is straightforward that public resources should not be applied to investigating it further. But as you go down the list, you get to things where judgments are much more difficult to make. Um, and actually, to go back to a point which has come up several times this morning, the thing which would most ease the administrative burden on my office would be removing the key principles from the code. Uh, as I've already mentioned, that accounts for around a fifth of the complaints which come to me. 
Uh, and by the way, I know that that is a controversial suggestion, and if you do interrogate the Standards Commission, I do not expect them to agree with me. Well, we might just do that. Um, I don't know if many of the members of the public would agree with that either, because then they will begin to, to think that if we're not actually dealing with the principles of the code, what's the point of the entire thing? Well, <laughs> Convener, I'm not suggesting the principles should be abandoned. Um, I just think it's unhelpful having them in a code where there are a set of specific rules um, and people are then given to believe uh, that because someone has not been, as they would see it, selfless, um, there is therefore a breach of the code. Um, an alternative would be to incorporate them in the undertaking which elected members sign on appointment to office. It is uh, the norm for me to play devil's advocate, Mr Thompson, as you well know. Um, already out there, some folk think that uh, uh, the entire situation here is uh, uh, bred a toothless tiger. If, if we turn around and say that we're taking the principles, uh, the key principles out, um, what do you think their reaction is going to be then? I can see the difficulty there, and I presume that's why others would disagree with it. Um, but if the key principles are not enforceable, what is the point of them being in there, is my answer to that. And if there are specific rules which can be breached, they should be comprehensive enough to cover the situations which are problematic. OK. Let's move a little bit off of that, and in terms of investigation itself, um, do you always get uh, full cooperation from other pu public bodies when you're carrying out investigations? From public bodies, yes, not always as quickly as I would like, but yes, I think is the answer. Um, is, are there any examples that you could give us where you feel that um, uh, other public bodies have maybe impeded your investigation or have not reacted quick enough to deal with the seriousness of a matter? I, I have no memory of or information about any body, public body impeding an investigation. Uh, if we're talking about the organisations, um, some individuals may operate differently. Um, on occasions when we're looking for background information, um, pressures of work can mean that they don't always come to our office as quickly as we would like, but um, we have to appreciate that everybody's busy. Yeah, but some, uh, some people prioritise the wrong things, maybe. <laughs> would you agree with that? Um, that's a very wide <laughs> statement. Um, they may not agree with my priorities. It doesn't mean they're the wrong things. Okay, Mr. Thompson, you're being very diplomatic. Uh, John Wilson, please. Convener, note in the, the letter of the 11th of February, uh, you indicate and you give a list of things that, uh, that you've included and in where you say in one of the bullet points where the complaint relates to circumstances occurring more than 12 months previously uh, and the person making the complaint could reasonably have been aware of them. Uh, do you think 12 months is a suitable period? Or should it, for instance, be reduced to six months? Because one of the issues that I'm aware of, because of the, some circumstances in local authority chambers, especially when there's a heated debate within the chamber and comments are made, that a number of local authorities do not either have any audio or video record of the comments that have been made that lead to circumstances where someone may have an outburst or and you'll know the case that I'm referring to, make certain gestures to other members in the chamber or that committee. Uh, but the, because there is no official record of that in the, the, in the debate leading up to the, that outburst, that you end up with potentially hearsay evidence uh, being made in relation to the complaints that are then lodged. Mr. Thompson. Yes. Um, the 12-month period... Um, was chosen uh, prior to my coming into post, I think by analogy with the um, members, uh, the code of conduct for members of this parliament. Um, it is a rule, uh, or it's certainly um, a criterion relevant to relevancy. Um, under that code, um, if it were shorter, 
from my point of view, that would potentially reduce the number of complaints that come in, but I'm not here. I don't think it's part of my role to reduce the number of complaints which can be made. I think the important thing is to deal with them reasonably. Um, it's a judgment call. Um, I don't have a particular view as to whether 12 months is the right period. Um, in some cases, people have tried to fall uh, forward, sorry, tried to go through uh, alternative complaint processes. Some of those take quite a long time. Um, and they can then, I think, quite reasonably come to me afterwards and say, well, I've been told after waiting whatever period it is that actually I should have put my complaint to you in the first place. Uh, and I would be very reluctant to reject that sort of complaint. Um, but I agree, uh, which I think was the point of Mr. Wilson's question, uh, that at that stage it can be more difficult to obtain evidence which is reliable. The and passage of time obviously makes that more difficult. And the comment about how particularly meetings, council meetings are recorded uh, and the evidence provided because, as I said, I'm aware that on a number of occasions you've had to then go to either other elected members or council officials uh, for comments or their recollection of the events leading up to the incident that uh, has been reported as a breach. I'm obviously aware of the situation you're describing. Um, I think it might be helpful for the committee to know that we quite often, um, even where there is a, a recording of some sort, and it may be a transcript rather than uh, a video recording, uh, we quite often go to other people who've been involved because apart from anything else, uh, the context in which something happens uh, is clearly important in interpreting um, the nature of it um, and how people perceive things is important. So I doubt if we will ever get away from having to rely on witness evidence, which, as you say, could be described as hearsay. Right. Thank you. We have, by the way, on occasions used YouTube uh, videos of people doing things um, in hearings. So social media does have some advantages. Just for clarification, Commissioner, is that YouTube videos of council proceedings? Um, because the, I, I am aware that certain local authorities prohibit the audio or video recording of meetings, including the restrictions on the public gallery from recording uh, proceedings of the council. Short answer to the question is no. Um, they have been used in the context of other public meetings, which were not council meetings as such. Um, you said earlier on today, uh, Mr. Thompson, that uh, there would have to be a revisit of some of this uh, by ministers uh, in terms of the changes that there are going to be uh, with integrated joint boards. Do you think at that time as well that gives the opportunity to look at Alios too, um, a matter which we discussed when you were before us last year? Um. I'm not ducking the question. I think that is really a matter for ministers, whether they're prepared to uh, widen the consideration to include Alios. It's easier for you if ministers were to revisit Alios at the same time as integrated joint boards. They are certainly another area where problems can occur, yes. Okay. Uh, can I thank you for your attendance today and I suspend to allow the witnesses uh, to leave for a very brief period. Thank you.
Um, our next item on the agenda is the consideration of five negative statutory instruments. Uh, the negative instruments are the Building Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-70, uh, the Building Energy Performance of Building Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-71, the Disabled Persons Badge for Motor Vehicles Scotland Amendment Regulations, SSI 2016-72. The Local Government Pension Scheme Management and Investment of Funds Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-74. The Charity Accounts Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-76. Do members have any comments on any of these instruments? No. Uh, is the committee... Oh, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks, Convener. See page five there. It's actually on the pensions uh, instrument. It's not disabled persons' badges as it is in the, he the heading there. Um, it describes in page six that this isn't a change of policy, but isn't changing from 15% investment in pension funds investment from 15% to 30% a significant change of policy? And what, what do we mean by uh, partnerships when these pension funds can be invested in partnerships? Where's the driver for this came from and uh, what's the justification for going from 15 to 30? And that seems like a huge amount of the pension fund you can decide to now invest in a partnership. Mr Coffey, my understanding is that um, these uh, are regulations which are likely amended every year. Um, if you give me two seconds. What we can do is we can write to um, the government to ask for further information, but we, can't, we do not have the ability to amend this. No. So um, we will write and we'll find you that, out that information. Um, can I ask, is the committee to content to agree it has no recommendations to make to Parliament in relation to this is instrument? I will agree. Thank you very much. Um, oh. I, can I ask that uh, that agreement applies to all of the instruments that I have just read out? Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, okay, as uh, agreed earlier in the meeting, we'll now move to private session. Um, I suspend uh, uh, for a little while to allow members of the public to leave. <laughs>